Hey guys, Gavin Gear here from UltimateReloader.com and MakingWithMetal.com. We are midway through this content series covering my 224 Valkyrie Remington 700 bolt action rifle build. In the last video, we talked about getting the barrel blank prepared and getting it secured in the lathe, getting it completely aligned, a totally critical part of the process. Now we're ready for the fun part, which is turning down the tenon, creating our thread relief, threading the tenon, cutting the counter bore, and chambering. Let's go over to the lathe and I'll walk you through the process. So this is my lathe. It's a Precision Matthews PM1440 GT. Absolutely love it. It's got the precision and the capacity and the features that I need for gunsmithing and it's done a great job. And like I said, in the last video where we ended up was we got the barrel blank installed in the lathe, we got it aligned, we got everything clamped down, just the right chuck jaw pressure, double checked our alignment, and that means we're ready to start machining. I consulted my build sheet and got two key figures off of that build sheet. One was the tenon diameter and the other was the tenon length. And this is where it's really nice to have a DRO on your lathe. I like to get my speeds and feeds figured out and then take a nice clean pass and without moving the compound or the cross slide, draw the tool back over, stop the lathe, read the diameter with a micrometer and then type that value in manually for the X value, the diameter. Now as we're making our cuts, we know exactly where we're at. And right at the end of the tenon, I like to zero out the tool, make a little shine mark on the end there so that we know exactly what our Z value is, which is the length of the tenon as we're cutting it as well. And like I said, I like to cut the tenon about 20 thousandths long, and I'll get to that reason in just a moment. There's a couple operations that follows the tenon turn down prior to threading. One is we need to cut the thread relief. And I like to take a parting tool and grind the end to a 90 degree profile so that we have a perfectly square notch. And I took one of the takeoff barrels and measured the OD of the threads on the tenon and then measured the diameter of the thread relief and just used the difference in the two values. You bring that parting blade or grooving tool in this case up to the OD of the tenon, zero out your X, and then as you go in, you're keeping track of the difference in diameters between the OD of the tenon and your thread relief, which will end up being the same value. It's 16 threads per inch in both case. It's the same depth that you need for both of those. Then it's time to clean up the shoulder. And for that, I use this tool, which is designed for cutting up to a shoulder and just took a few thousandths of an inch on going from the outside in until I hit the diameter of the thread relief. You wanna do a nice slow feed, you wanna get a really good finish on that because this is the surface that's gonna be perfectly square and it's gonna crush the recoil lug against your receiver and you need that to all line up perfectly. So this is why we cut the tenon a little bit long is when we do our thread relief and when we square up the shoulder, we're gonna be altering that tenon length. And I usually like to get those perfect and then in terms of their dimensionality and the finish, and then go out to the face and just face the tenon down to the appropriate length. This is a critical dimension because it's gonna be our end play, the play between the end of the tenon and that outward face of the bolt logs. Super critical value. And again, we have to take into account our crush when we tighten the barrel down. All of that is critical, and as long as you create a good build sheet and stay to your build sheet, you're gonna be good. So, at this point, you're ready for threading, and what I like to do is file off or cut a chamfer at the very end of the barrel where those threads are gonna start, because that's gonna give us a nice clean threading job, and then we screw on the receiver, it's gonna go on nice and smooth. It's a really nice way to do that. And what you wanna do is take some die cam, and you wanna kinda of paint the tenon area with die chem, let it dry, and then get your threading tool on, set your feed rate, in this case we're at 16 threads per inch. Every time we engage those half nuts, we're gonna be cutting at, at 16 threads per inch. And then with the spindle operating at a slow speed, you're gonna to wanna to bring that tool up near the end of where the tenon is and just bring it in until you get a nice shiny ring. Then take your compound. I like to have the compound set at 29 degrees because it's going to give you a nice clean chip on the one side. 
and it's going to give a little bit of cut on the other side to help burnish that other edge and give you good surface quality. Crank the compound in one thousandth of an inch and then take a threading pass and check it with a thread gauge. This is just to make sure that you are spot on with how you've set up the lathe. Double check with your tenon as well with the same thread gauge. Just make sure your thread values agree because this is super critical stuff. And once you get to that point, you can start taking multiple passes following a normal single point threading operation. And these threads are super critical because ultimately they kind of define the interface between the receiver and the barrel in terms of the concentric alignment. So take your time. Uh, I like to try and get a really good surface finish and with these carbide tools I'm finding that sometimes the lathe likes a faster speed. Uh, last time I did a barrel I, I threaded it at, at 70 rpm and I, that's one above the lowest speed of the lathe. This time I had it all the way up to 250 rpm. It was cooking for single point threading but you could hear the difference the tool comes across the threads, the chip is nice and clean, and you don't hear the chatter. It's just a constant sound of cutting, and it sounds really, really good. So the big question is, how deep to cut the threads? Well, what I like to do is to take a takeoff barrel. This is one of my two Remington 700 takeoff barrels that a gunsmithing friend gave me, and a digital caliper, and then Follow the profile of the thread and get the jaws into the troughs of the thread and then zero out the caliper. Now, when you go to measure the thread diameter over here, you have a relative distance that you need to close in on for the diameter and you should be right on. But you don't want to go all the way. As we get to within five thousandths or ten thousandths, you want to start trying to screw the receiver on with that recoil lug in place. You got to have the recoil lug as a spacer because it won't screw all the way on otherwise. And what you'll find is, as you're approaching the appropriate thread diameter, you'll get a couple threads of engagement and then you'll cut another thousandth or half thousandth of an inch uh, in terms of the compound distance and then it'll thread halfway. And then you keep doing that until you can get the receiver to screw all the way up against the recoil lug with slight resistance the whole way. That's a tight thread fit, that's excellent. You can use a little carbide lapping paste to lap the threads together and then make sure you clean that off really good. So, you know, at this point, you're done with the threading. Good job. Now it's time to go on to cutting the counter more. I consulted my build sheet to get the counterbore depth and diameter and then went to work cutting the counterbore. I took multiple passes, cutting the counterbore to depth, leaving the diameter slightly undersized. This gave me the ability to follow that up with a couple boring passes to get the counterbore diameter dead on. Once the counterbore was finished, it was time for chambering. So for chambering, I'm using a JGS floating reamer holder. I'm using a PTG Sammy Spec 224 Valkyrie chambering reamer. This is a finished reamer with interchangeable pilots. So I could basically use the same pilots I used with the grizzly rod for the indicating and I already know which bushing I need because I have the same fit that I want for a chambering reamer. That's going to allow a more precise fit in the bore and all else being equal that's going to cut a better chamber because we're just going to be able to have that chambering reamer follow the bore more closely. And for this chambering setup, I'm just using Viper's Venom. This is a high sulfur oil that a lot of gunsmiths use for chambering. And squirting a bit of the Viper's Venom in the bore and then liberally coating the chambering reamer and then bringing the chambering reamer up against the chamber being cut and then applying a slight bit of pressure. I then start the lathe spindle. I do my plunge, which is the, the depth of the cut and then I let the spindle rotate freely without advancing the reamer and then stop the spindle. And what this does is it prevents chips from getting caught between the reamer flutes and the chamber walls. And if you don't have a lot of body taper, that can be a really, really important thing. Between each plunge, I'm wiping the chips off of the reamer and I'm blowing out the bore and making sure that all the chips are off of both and reapplying the lube and then going for another plunge. When I get to about half, two thirds, I start to take some checks. So I've got my go gauge and I can put that 
into the bore where the chamber is. And the way the math worked out on this particular build, I needed to be at a situation where the back of the go gauge was flush with the end of the tent. And then I knew that the chamber would be at the proper depth, more or less. <laughs> and so when you get close to that point, when there's about 10 or 20 thousandths left, then it's time to start screwing on the receiver with the recoil lug in place, with your go gauge in the bolt, close the bolt handle, and then tighten the receiver until it sort of bottoms out. The go gauge is bottoming out against the shoulder of the chamber, and that's testing kind of for your headspace. And what will happen will be, if you're not cut deep enough, which we know we aren't yet, there will be a gap between the recoil lug and the receiver. And what you want to do is put a feeler gauge in there so that you know how much further you need to go to finish your chamber cut. And so you want to incrementally work your way up and check multiple times. The last thousandth of an inch is really important. And you got to remember about your crush as well because we're going to lose a couple thousandths of an inch with this type of a setup when we tighten the barrel into the receiver. And so what I decided to do was I used the Gordy Gritters technique with the go gauge by putting a piece of scotch tape on the back. That's about two thousandths of an inch and that converts a go gauge into a no go gauge. I cut the chamber so that the bolt handle with the bolt handle closed and the no go gauge in place. It, uh, it was just perfect. So I cut the chamber two thousandths of an inch too deep by using a no go gauge to check my chamber cut depth. So with the chamber cut, it was time to polish the chamber. And you don't want to over polish the chamber. Your brass needs some grip, otherwise it will result in excessive bolt thrust and it will elongate your brass. So I just take a little bit of 320 grit, you know, wet and dry paper. I put it on a wood dowel and put some oil on it, some cutting oil, and just give it a light polish. This is just to remove, you know, some of the imperfections and scratches but you leave enough scratches in there so that the brass can grab onto the chamber walls when it's under pressure while the cartridge is being fired. And I also broke the edge where the exit of the chamber goes into the counter bore and I just gave it a little bit of a break. That's gonna prevent the brass from scratching when a cartridge is being chambered. But if you overdo a chamfer or a rounding off of that transition, you essentially have unsupported brass in that section and that's definitely not what you want. So with all of that complete, uh, the barrel work on the breech end was basically done. And in the next video, I'm gonna go over the final machining process prior to assembling the rifle and that's threading the muzzle. So you're gonna wanna check that out. I've got a detailed write-up on ultimatereloader.com and makingwithmetal.com and so if you don't want to miss the rest of the series, make sure you subscribe to Gavin Tube with notifications. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Until next time, happy machining, happy reloading, and happy shooting.